Good morning and good evening uh, and good afternoon. I'm Jen Houston. I am the Chief Marketing Officer at D-Wave, and we are excited to invite you all today to our first Analyst Day. So thanks for joining us. A couple housekeeping things. You'll note at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. If you do have any questions, please send those questions uh, through the Q&A button. You can just click on it, write your question in. Everything that is, uh, all questions are anonymous. So the only person that will see them is me um, and the panelists. And uh, we'll make sure we get your questions answered. We know that's really a, an important part of the day today. Um, the other opportunity we'll have for Q&A, that'll be at the end. The other opportunity we'll have for Q&A is we actually have a customer panel um, during the middle of the session, and we'll make sure we open it up for questions there. So if you have questions during the session, throw them into the Q&A and I'll track them. And if you have questions um, at, during the actual customer or the end Q&A, we'll, we'll bring those all back in at that time. So welcome. I would like to first start by welcoming all of you and introducing Alan Barretts, our CEO of D-Wave. Alan? Thank you, Jen. Uh, as Jen said, my name is Alan Barrett. I'm the CEO at D-Wave. I've been with the company for about five years now. I joined originally to run the R&D organization, and I took over as the CEO about two and a half years ago. Uh, if we go a little further into my background, I was the first president of JavaSoft at Sun Microsystems, where I was responsible for bringing the Java technology to market, growing the revenue, growing the developer ecosystem. A lot of what we did there is similar to what we're doing now at D-Wave as we're creating an entirely new industry and building a new ecosystem here. I've also been a senior executive at a number of other large companies. I've been a private company CEO three times prior to D-Wave and I've been a venture investor. I was a managing director at Warburg Pincus and I opened their first Bay Area office. Uh, educationally, I have a doctorate from MIT in theory of computation. So while I'm not a quantum physicist, uh, I do a pretty good job of holding my own with our spectacular uh, engineering and science team. And now I'll turn it over to John to introduce himself. Good morning, everybody. And thank you uh, for joining us uh, today. I joined uh, D-Wave as Chief Financial Officer in the middle part of last year. Previously, I have served as a CFO uh, for about 25 years in various uh, sectors of the technology industry uh, across all stages of development. And I have uh, previously led two traditional uh, IPOs. Thanks, John. And I'm going to flip through the disclaimers and turn it over to Emil to introduce himself. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Emil Michael. I'm the chairman and CEO of the DPCM Capital SPAC. Uh, I was formerly the chief business officer at Uber, which was uh, about my fourth startup in the Silicon Valley. Uh, as you can see from the pictures on this slide, uh, we have surrounded ourselves at our SPAC with uh, all former entrepreneurs and operators and some current, uh, including Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, Betsy Atkins, who is a world-class governance expert, Peter Diamandis, who's a futurist and uh, founder of Singularity University. And the idea behind our SPAC was to find a management team that was thinking about long-term value creation. And us not being financial engineers, but instead being entrepreneurs and operators, partnering with that team in a deep way for the long-term. I intend to join the board after the DSPAC, and I'm very much looking forward to partnering with Alan, John, and the team to build a great company for the long term. All right, thanks, Camille. So let's go ahead and uh, get into it. Uh, we're really excited to be able to spend the next two hours with you. Uh, we're gonna cover the DOA business and products. As Jen said, we're gonna give you an opportunity to hear from some of our customers, and we're gonna give you a demo of one of our new product capabilities that's uh, really interesting and really exciting. Uh, it should be a fun morning, so let's go ahead and get started. First of all, and in some sense, most important, D-Wave is quite unique in that we are the first and currently only commercial quantum computing company. We have over two dozen Fortune 2000 customers working on real business applications to benefit their business operations. So while everybody else in the industry talks about government research funding as revenue, and they talk about national labs and academic institutions as customers. We talk about companies like Volkswagen or Johnson & Johnson, GlaxoSmithKline, Denso, Save on Foods as our customers. And we talk about the actual applications that we're working on with them to help benefit their business. Uh, 
We got here by taking a very different approach to quantum computing. And as we go through the discussion, it will become clear what that approach was and why it is so valuable. Just to start with a few key facts regarding D-Wave. First of all, we are a full stack quantum provider. We develop and provide everything from the quantum computers to the quantum cloud service, to the software development tools, all the way up through to professional services. Our current generation quantum computer is our Advantage quantum computer. It's a 5,000 qubit system. It's our fifth generation system. Our quantum cloud service is called Leap. We launched it back in 2018. It was then and still is the only real time quantum cloud service. We own all of the key intellectual property for all of our products. In fact, we have over 200 US granted patents and over 100 in process worldwide. And these uh, patents cover everything from superconducting circuit fabrication, because we do use superconducting technology, to quantum circuit design, to IO, to refrigeration, all the way up through to hybrid algorithms and applications. In fact, in 2021, we were in the top five for quantum patents alongside IBM, Google, Intel, and Northrop Grumman, and well ahead of any of the independent quantum computing companies. Our business model is primarily a cloud-based recurring revenue quantum compute as a service model. And by that, I mean that our customers have applications that require quantum compute cycles, and they pay us on a recurring revenue basis to access those compute cycles through our Leap cloud service. However, currently, many of our customers require help understanding which applications can most benefit from quantum and how to build out those applications. And so we also have a professional services component to our business model. Currently about 50% of our revenue is professional services and 50% is quantum compute as a service. However, as we look out over the five year horizon, we pretty rapidly get to the point where well north of 90% of our revenue is recurring quantum compute as a service. And that's really where we wanna be because that's what's allowing us to build backlog and have more predictable revenue growth. And the reason we get there is because the professional services engagements are relatively short upfront engagements, but once the applications move into production, they run year after year after year and continue to generate recurring revenue for us. And as you can see from this chart, we have a strong and growing customer base. I named some of them, but just to name them again, Volkswagen, Johnson & Johnson, GlaxoSmithKline, Deloitte, BBVA, Save On Foods, and the list goes on and on. Okay, so what is quantum computing? Uh, very simply, Quantum computing is all about using quantum mechanical effects to be able to solve hard computational problems faster than they can be solved using existing classical computers. And there are two classes of problems that quantum computers can be used to solve. There's what I'll call revolutionary problems or, pro or problems that are currently unsolvable, things like global weather modeling. The solutions to these problems will deliver unimaginable, un, unimaginable impact on uh, society and as well as businesses. Then there are what I'll call more evolutionary applications. These are applications that businesses are using today to help run their operations. But these problems are so hard that what businesses do today is they use heuristics to try to come up with good enough solutions. But with quantum computers, we can deliver optimal or better solutions to help improve their business operations, reduce costs, and drive revenue. So let's talk a minute about how quantum computing works. Uh, and I'm going to describe it uh, by using a specific application. Uh, this is an application that we developed for the Department of Homeland Security in the height of the pandemic. The problem is as follows. You have a set of hospitals and hospitals have resources. These resources can be things like beds or ventilators. Some hospitals have more resources than they need. Those are depicted by the small blue circles in the large circle on the right. Some hospitals have fewer resources than they need. Those are depicted by the small red circles in the large circle on the right. The problem is simply to group hospitals together so that collectively 
they have all the resources they need to cover the geographic area that they need to cover. Sounds like a very simple problem, but actually it's computationally very complex. In fact, it's what we call an exponentially hard problem. At just 1,000 hospitals, this is out of the reach of classical computers to be able to solve optimally. So how does quantum computing help you with this? Well, traditional classical computers use bits to store information. A bit can be either a zero or a one at any given point in time. What this means is that at any point in time, a classical computer is looking at one possible solution to the problem, evaluating it, and then trying to see if there's a better solution. But it's essentially sequential. With quantum computers, we use qubits. Qubits can be in the state zero and one at the same time. We call this superposition. What this means is that essentially quantum computers can quote, see all the possible solutions at the same time and more quickly iterate to find the optimal solution. There are two primary approaches to quantum computing. There's what's called annealing quantum computing and what's called gate model quantum computing. At D-Wave, we decided early on that we wanted to take a practical approach to quantum computing. And by that, I mean an approach that would allow us to get quantum computers out into the hands of developers, customers, users as quickly as possible so that we and they could learn from the use of those systems. As a result, we selected annealing. We decided to start with annealing quantum computing. And we selected annealing for three reasons. First of all, it's much easier to scale annealing quantum computers. That's why we're now at 5,000 qubits when everybody else who's working on gate model is at about 50 qubits. Annealing quantum computers are much less sensitive to errors. We can deliver good solutions to hard problems without the need for error correction. And finally, annealing quantum computers are very good at solving optimization problems. And optimization represents most of the important hard problems that businesses need to solve. These are things like employee scheduling or autonomous vehicle routing for manufacturing plant floor optimization or uh, bin packing containers on ships or on freights to improve supply chain operations or peptide design for use in new drugs. As you can see, these are all very important problems. They also happen to be very hard problems and they are optimization problems which are well suited to annealing quantum computers. So how does annealing work? Well, annealing quantum computers do only one thing, but they do it really well. What they do is they find the lowest point in a multidimensional landscape. And what's so interesting and important about this is that all optimization problems can be mapped into that problem. That's why we say that annealing is natively an optimization engine. This also means that it's very easy to program an annealing quantum computer. All you have to do is take your optimization problem and reformulate it as that low point in a multidimensional landscape, which is a very straightforward process. So annealing represents a much easier on-ramp to quantum computing. And because it's easier to build annealing systems, we've been able to get to the point where we are in fact commercial today. Let's talk for a minute about gate model. Gate model systems are a bit more like classical computers in the sense that you program them by specifying the sequence of instructions needed to solve the problem. The difference is the instructions are very complicated. And in fact, there's a very steep learning curve to programming gate model systems. Moreover, gate model systems are very sensitive to noise and errors. You need error correction to be able to compute solutions to problems. And they're very, very difficult to scale. After you know, 20 plus years, we're still talking about 50 qubits on gate model systems. In fact, we believe that it's gonna take seven or more years to get to the point where gate model systems are commercial in the way that annealing systems are today. But gate model systems are very important because gate model systems are very good 
at solving a different class of problems, differential equations. And this is required to solve problems like quantum chemistry or computational fluid dynamics, which are required for important problems like uh, new drug discovery, developing designer drugs, new material design, long lasting batteries, and so on. Moreover, uh, over the course of the last year, we, we, and by we, I mean the academic community as well as the industry, learned something very important about these two approaches to quantum computing and the problems that they can solve. We learned that there's actually a bifurcation in the application market. Namely, while annealing is very good at solving optimization problems, gate model systems are not very good at solving optimization problems. In fact, they likely will never be able to deliver speed ups on optimization problems. However, while gate model systems are very good at solving differential equations, annealing systems are not. And so we're in an environment where we'll always need annealing for some classes of problems and gate model for other classes of problems. And then there are problems where either a quantum computer will work. Uh, and these fall into the area of linear algebra, that's essentially machine learning problems and factorization, uh, which is really uh, crypto-based applications. Well, I said that annealing quantum computers are easier to build than gate model systems. But even at that, quantum computing is not for the faint of heart. It took us well over 10 years to get to the point where we had a commercial quantum computer. As you can see on the top line on this chart, our Advantage quantum computer is our fifth generation system, 10 plus years after we get, began development. And the first 10 years were primarily about government and academic research to try to understand on the one hand, what types of problems were well suited to annealing, and on the other hand, how to best build out the annealing quantum computer. But with our Advantage system launched about a year ago, we are now at the point where annealing systems are commercial. Gate model systems, however, are still in their infancy. Today, what we have in the gate model space are what's called noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. These are small systems, maybe 50 qubits without error correction that aren't really particularly good for doing anything but research experimentation. Kind of where we were back in 2011 with the D-Wave 1. And there are many transitions that we're going to need to go through with gate model systems. We're gonna to need to start seeing partial error correction, then full error correction, then scalability before we can get to the point where gate model systems are commercial. And this is why I say that we believe it's seven plus years before we get to the point where gate model systems are commercial. Okay, so I started talking about what makes D-Wave unique when I described annealing uh, versus gate model, and the fact that we decided to start with annealing quantum computers. Um, however, because of the fact that our annealing quantum computers are now commercial, and as a result, we've solved most of the really hard research problems that needed to be solved to get here. So we're transitioning our annealing program to a more traditional product development cycle. Every couple of years, you know, larger systems with more performance. That means that we now have research bandwidth to apply to another class of hard problems. In addition, as we developed our annealing quantum computers, we developed some very important technologies that we can also apply to another class of problems. And for that reason, we announced about six months ago that we are now also building a gate model system applying our research capabilities and some of the important technologies that we had to develop for our annealing systems to building a scaled error corrected gate model system. What this means is that D-Wave is now the only company in the world focused on both annealing and gate. The reason is we're the only company in the world that does annealing and now we're adding gate. 
So the only company in the world doing both annealing and gate. As I mentioned previously, we are a full stack provider providing everything from the quantum computers to the cloud service, to the software development tools, all the way up through to professional services. In fact, the only company that has as complete a stack as ours is IBM. Um, however, we are far more complete than any of the independent quantum computing companies. A third important point of differentiation for us is our quantum cloud service. We run our own quantum cloud service called Leap. We launched it back in 2018 to support real-time access to the quantum computer, but we designed it not just to support research experimentation, but also to support business applications in production, worrying about reliability, availability, security, and privacy. In fact, we've had to pass audits with customers on those capabilities of our systems. We've got a proven track record of on-time product delivery, both hardware and software. As I said, our Advantage quantum computer is our fifth generation quantum computer. And we've developed, uh, demonstrated significant speed ups on important real world problems. The problem referenced here, three million times speed up is a magnetic materials phase transition computation. This is known as the kosterlitz thulis phase transition. The theory behind it won the Nobel Prize back in 2016. And we've been able to perform that computation 3 million times faster than it can be performed using Monte Carlo on a classical system, which is the approach of choice for a classical systems solving this problem. <clears throat> and finally, because of the fact that we are commercial today with our annealing quantum computers, we have a very important first mover advantage. We're out there in the market today, building the customer base, uh, developing applications, and then able to take our customers through the various transitions as the annealing quantum computers become more powerful and as we start introducing the gate model systems. <clears throat> this also means that we don't have to worry about how long it's gonna take to get to the point where gate model systems are commercial and generate revenue because we can build our business today on annealing and then integrate gate model as they become available. The quantum, uh, the, the, the total addressable market for quantum is very large. Um, this chart is uh, based on the Boston Consulting Group data. Uh, it's pretty much the data that everybody in the quantum industry uses. BCG puts the TAM for quantum at two to five billion in the near term, growing to 450 to 850 billion in roughly the 20 year time frame. Moreover, BCG estimates that about 20% of this TAM is what's available to the quantum hardware, software, and services providers. That's us and others in the industry. And those are the green numbers at the bottom. So, uh, you know, for the quantum players, it's 400 million to a billion in the near term, growing to about 90 to 150, uh, 170 billion in roughly the 20 year time frame. Moreover, BCG does divide the TAM into the four technology areas I mentioned previously. Combinatorial optimization, the kinds of problems that I previously mentioned, employee scheduling, autonomous vehicle routing, and so on. Uh, linear algebra, machine learning, factorization, crypto, and differential equations for simulation or quant quantum chemistry or computational fluid dynamics. BCG estimates that about a quarter of the TAM is uh, allocated to each of these technology areas. What that means is that a quarter of this TAM is available to only D-Wave because we are the only company in the world that provides annealing quantum computers and annealing is required for optimization. And so that portion of the market is ours. Um, the rest of the market is competitive across all the players, including D-Wave, uh, as we're now entering the gate model space. Okay, so as you evaluate different quantum technologies and quantum providers, what's important? You'll hear most people in the industry talk about things like gate fidelity or coherence time or logical qubits or connectivity, and they come up with esoteric technology-based metrics to evaluate themselves against one another. 
But the reason they're doing that is because their systems aren't yet capable of running real applications. But at the end of the day, that's really what matters. What matters is, can you run a customer's application? Can you deliver better performance at reasonable cost on those applications? And so really what matters at the end of the day in evaluating uh, uh, quantum technology is what it takes to be commercial. So what does it take to be commercial? You need products, you need applications running on those products because nobody buys hardware for hardware's sake. You buy it because of the applications it runs. And there needs to be a market and you need to have market adoption. Well, at D-Wave, uh, we've already talked about our products and I've already mentioned a number of applications that can run on our products, but I'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a minute. I'd also like to point out that in 2021, last year, over two thirds of our quantum compute as a service revenue came from commercial customers. And as I've already said, more than two dozen Fortune Global 2000 customers are in that group. Collectively, we have over 55 commercial customers. So uh, we've got the products uh, and we have customers that are leveraging those products. And for sure, the market is ready. Um, if the fact that we actually have customers like those I mentioned previously, running applications like some of those I mentioned previously isn't enough, there have been a number of studies done on the market demand for quantum. About two years ago, 451 Research surveyed about 1,000 Fortune 5,000 companies. And what they found was that over four in five of those companies had an application that they wanted to use on quantum sometime within the next three years. But almost 40% of those companies said that they had a quantum use case that they were working on at that point in time. Hyperion has just recently done a similar survey and in that survey, the number is now over 60% of companies surveyed actually are working on a quantum application today. For D-Wave, we are focused initially on three verticals. We're focused on manufacturing and logistics as the first vertical, pharma as the second, and finance as the third. Every application that you see on this chart is an application that we have worked on or are working on with one of our customers. So, you know, I talked about uh, bin packing for being able to optimize how uh, packages or containers are loaded onto ships or rail in support of the supply chain. Employee scheduling, last mile routing for e-commerce delivery. Uh, protein folding in the development of new peptides for various therapeutics, uh, optimizing clinical trials, uh, portfolio risk reduction or portfolio optimization within a given risk profile, fraud detection. These are all applications that we have worked on uh, with customers. And these are customers like you know, Volkswagen or Denso or Save On Foods. Johnson & Johnston, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, in the finance area, BBVA, Bank of Canada, Keisha Bank. Just some examples of you know, the fact that we are commercial today, working with real customers on real applications to benefit their operations. We engage with our customers through a four-phase engagement model. The first phase is a two-month, $50,000 application evaluation, where we, we work with our customer to help them understand which of their applications can best benefit from our quantum systems and services. We then move on to a five-month, $350,000 proof of concept, where we build a proof of concept for one of their applications. Then another five-month, 
$350,000 pilot deployment where we help them bring that application up in their environment on a, a small scale. And then finally, the application moves into full scale production where we charge between $500,000 and a million dollars per year per application to access the quantum compute cycles required to run the application. And the amount we charge is based on the size and complexity of the application, as well as the frequency with which it needs to access the quantum computer. The first three phases are professional services. The fourth phase is that recurring quantum compute as a service uh, revenue phase. Moreover, an important component of this model is upsell. We have had multiple customers who have started with a single proof of concept, move that to pilot, and then come back to work on a second or a third application. So there's a very important upsell component to this model as well. Okay, we're at a really interesting and important moment in the quantum computing industry, a watershed moment. We are just now at the point where quantum computing is becoming commercial. Admittedly, it's a annealing-based quantum computing, and it's D-Wave that's leading the charge with our first mover advantage, but we are at the point where quantum is becoming commercial. And quantum represents a huge market opportunity. In fact, if you look back over the last 40 years or so at some of the key innovations, technological advances and the businesses that were built on them from the personal computer through the internet, smartphones, AI, ML, and you look at the mature market TAM, where those TAMs are today, you know, quantum computing exceeds all of them. So it's a really exciting time and a really exciting moment in time for us. What we wanna do now is let you hear from some of our customers. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it back over to Jen, who is going to uh, introduce our panel of customers and we'll do a little bit of Q and A with them. Jen, over to you. Great, Alan, thank you so much. And um, thanks to everyone. We're starting to get questions. I just wanna remind you, if you do have a question, please put it into the Q and A box instead of the chat. And we'll make sure we're tracking those questions. Um, we'll also have about five minutes at the end of the customer uh, presentations with customer conversation to answer a couple questions as well as with them. So do be thinking about your questions. So I wanna welcome Kate Abray from Deloitte, Sam Mugel from Multiverse and Dustin Johnson from Save on Foods three fabulous people who have, I think, really unique perspectives about quantum um, from three different vantage points. So Alan, I'm gonna hand them over to you, hand it back to you and uh, start the fireside chat. Okay, sounds good. And, and hopefully they've all turned on their uh, video. And uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually start with, uh, with you, Kate, uh, from Deloitte. So um, you've got a broad view of the enterprise market and emerging technologies in your role at Deloitte. Um, what I'm wondering is, what's your view of the state of the quantum industry and quantum customers? Hey, Alan. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to chat with you today. So, yeah, we do have a broad um, perspective as to where clients are from quantum. And what I would say is, really, there it's, it's in its infancy. Um, clients are very interested in quantum, and they are starting to finally ask questions about how quantum applies to them but they're in the experimenting phase. They don't yet have a vision as to how to scale it. And what I think is fascinating about that is it allows us to stand with them side by side with D-Wave to discuss and plot out a logical journey that allows them to do it in a sensible fashion, achieving business value along the way and, and, and thinking about how it's a, it's a quantum plus traditional compute story versus an either or. And I think that there's an educational element that, you know, we're in the process of working with, with you and others to, uh, to really help our clients to understand what does quantum mean for them and how can they use it and apply it to their business, um, given that, you know, 
it's a big word that's out there. Um, I can tell you even within the Air Force just this week, um, we've had multiple clients say, can you come talk to me about how quantum would work for us? So it's, it's a great time, it's exciting. And they're looking at all set, sorts of problem sets from supply chain to, um, to personnel vetting, to hiring, to uh, logistics, to intelligence. Um, so a wide swath of, of opportunities. That's great, Kate. Can, can you just say a little bit more about how you're working with D-Wave and, and what excites you? Oh yeah. I mean, D-Wave has been a fantastic partner. I, I, it's so differentiated uh, in terms of what you guys are, are bringing to the market. Um, the, the thing that I'm most excited about is to give you an example. We're working with the Savannah School of Art and Design together um, to develop a, uh, a prototype around scheduling. And this is really, really interesting because it's scheduling um, a use case for the Transportation Security Administration, something that we all feel and, and, and sense every day, which is the folks at the checkpoint when we're traveling. And it seems like it's a simple problem, but it's really not. It's very, very complicated how those folks are scheduled. They have a huge call out rate. There's a logistics problem. So what we're doing is we're working with you at D-Wave, um, very thankfully for that, to create a way to help both the employee better schedule their time and the manager better optimize the schedule. And so it helps TSA from a workforce perspective when there's this war, of, war on talent. It helps us, the traveling public, because it means we don't have to wait in as many lines because they can do a better job of scheduling. And it helps the manager so that they're not doing all of this manual backend processing. And we're wrapping it with a very user-centered, easy to use process powered by the amazing computing knowledge, power, and algorithms that D-Wave brings to bear. So that's just one example of something I'm really excited about with, uh, with D-Wave. And it's going live in the beginning of June, and I'm pumped to get it out and market together. That's great, Kate, and it's a pleasure to be working with you. Um, let's move to Sam now from Multiverse. Uh, so Sam, uh, good to see you again. Um, arguably, Multiverse may be one of the first quantum ISVs. So you, you also have a unique perspective on the industry. What are you seeing from customers you're working with on quantum applications? Uh, hi, Alan, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, so we're seeing a huge interest uh, from industry. Uh, to pick up on what Kate was saying, I think um, there's an awful lot of people that clearly really want to learn about quantum, that want to see the potential and that don't necessarily realize that we can, we can del deliver like industrial value today. Um, and so that's really exciting to take them through this journey and, and show them the, um, the, uh, our products are able to, uh, to bring them value. I think where I've seen a big change recently has been where it used to be uh, the quantum champion in an organization would reach out to us and say, hey, let's do a project together. Um, now, even people that are not uh, quantum savvy in a way are looking to, to do projects with us. And I think this is a very good sign. I think uh, this shows that people even that don't have a background in uh, like physics are seeing that there's something really important that's happening with uh, quantum computing. And uh, people want to use quantum themselves and, and they want to use it even if they are not themselves quantum experts. So yeah, I think that's, that's a very exciting uh, situation to be in. And Sam, I think I think you made a great point there that you know um, you know until recently, uh, when you would engage with uh, a business customer, uh, you were typically talking to the innovation team. Uh, but now we're seeing the beginnings of that moving to the line of business, which is also a very important transition. By the way, I should also point out that when I mentioned BBVA and Keisha Bank and Bank of Canada previously, that's actually work that Multiverse did, uh, leveraging the DOA system, working with those customers. So, so Sam, can you tell us a bit more about some of the use cases and applications that you've actually worked on in Quantum? Oh, absolutely. Um, so with uh, BBVA, this was uh, one of our first projects and really, really exciting on portfolio optimization. We saw this as a low hanging fruit um, because optimization hardware is, is so much more developed in quantum than, than other hardwares. And, um, 
and we use this opportunity to, to make and publish an awful lot of benchmarking that, that really showed, okay, so what's the direct return on investment of using quantum today? And, and we got some uh, super exciting results. We, we saw the um, uh, D-Wave in particular and D-Wave hybrid technology was able to solve huge problem sizes that um, the standard methods could, could not even begin to approach. So that was super exciting. Um, we've recently finished a project with Bank of Canada. Um, and I think this was exciting in a different way. We were looking at um, how to predict the effects of regulations. And I'd, I'd say this is exciting because this is something we're incredibly bad at doing um, as a society today. So it's a bit of a, um, we're this is an op a place where quantum computing can really create a market. And finally, we're starting a project with Bosch. It's going to be a multi-year project um, on predictive maintenance, a multi-million dollar problem for, for Bosch. Great, thanks, Sam. And, and now, Dustin, good to see you again as well. Uh, you all are a quantum pioneer. Uh, you're on track to be one of the first companies in the world putting a quantum hybrid application into production. So can you maybe take a minute to tell us about your journey? How did you get here? And why are you excited about your work in quantum? Yeah, good morning. Th thanks, Alan. Um, excited to be here as well. And I'll, I'll kind of branch off um, a little bit what uh, Kate was discussing. But what, at, during COVID for the past two years, um, I, I know we started engaging with uh, D-Wave uh, early COVID days. And we were at a time uh, in the grocery space, so Save on Foods, uh, obviously we're, we're, we oversee, we amass to about uh, 300 stores across Western Canada, uh, up through the Yukon and now down to uh, in the state, uh, state of Oregon. And, um, and we're vertically integrated. So when you're facing all these events, there's so much volatility these days. We've got, you know, we're, we're in the midst of war, we've got, um, you know, we've got COVID, we are still seeing the effects of COVID. And, and at that time, um, the business was really craving faster information. How can we make better decisions faster? And, and that, was, that was the key to us um, starting to look for different opportunities because um, we, we, need, we need to react fast. We couldn't wait one week, two weeks to get uh, the results we needed to make quick decisions about our supply chain, about to operate and support our stores. So that led us down the journey. And, uh, you know, I, I had a close relationship with a lot of the, uh, you know, physicists that moved over from D-Wave from previous lives. So I'm like, hey, you know what? There, there was a great opportunity there um, to have a collaborative research agreement. And, and so we connected with, uh, with you guys, Alan. And um, for the past two years, we've been trying to solve that problem, getting insights to the business faster. And, and uh, we're now at a state where, um, you know, over time, building the teams, um, uh, so uh, one thing is, you know, getting the teams to mesh together with uh, D-Wave and getting the business to understand the value out of uh, quantum. And that, that's always been a challenge um, uh, in, in the early stages of, you know, uh, we're jumping into this new technology. But uh, now that we're starting to see the results um, and the impact, uh, we're now moving to deployment and we're months away from getting, um, you know, going live um, in, in terms of, you know, rolling out this new quantum um, opportunity. Thanks, Justin. And can you tell us just a bit more about the application, what you've learned through the process? Yes. Um, so there was, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, getting to that state, I think one of the, the biggest challenges was really because quantum is quantum is this uh, kind of new beast that enters the market and and it's really getting the business uh, safe on foods a hundred year old company how do we get the business to understand the value of quantum right it's uh, and and where where are we seeing quantum annealing come into applications and it's really to solve these very complex customized problems that black these traditional kind of black box solutions just don't handle. And uh, so we see a lot of this out there, right? AI models come in and they try to fill a need, um, a general need. But where we started to see quantum come in is, is really the ability, we needed to be fine tuned. We have a unique problem, we have a unique business. And the ability to bring in, grow a team and collaborate with quantum engineers to be able to develop these fine tuned solutions, that's where we started to see the value. So in my point of view, uh, in terms of learnings and hopefully for other organizations out there facing the same thing, 
the the you know the value I see and kind of the learnings is is really building up um, that strong team of uh, you know uh, machine learning engineers, data scientists, and and really getting the business um, to understand you know to really building up that team, building that relationship with the business to understand how we can get achieve faster results, faster speed, and be able to support their fine tuned needs uh, more effectively. Thanks, Dustin. I have just one more question for all of you, and then uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Jen, who will field some uh, questions from uh, the folks listening in. Um, so uh, the question is uh, for all of you to think about, what's one piece of advice that you would want the audience to know about quantum that you wish you had known when you got started? And so let me start with you, Kate. What's that one piece of advice that you wish you had known when you got started? I think it goes back to something that I said um, previously, which is it's not quantum or traditional compute, it's quantum and traditional compute. That's Good. my piece of advice. Absolutely, it's all, it's all about hybrid. You've got to bring the two together. And uh, Sam, how about you? Uh, yeah, well, building up on that. Um, so you, you can actually deliver value before we reach advantage. And I think this is something that lots of people don't realize that even if we don't have a problem that quantum computers can, can solve like way better than uh, uh, that a classical computer can't solve, there's, there's definitely like place for both to exist, to coexist. And Dustin, what's that one thing you wished you had known when you started? That it's, uh, it's achievable. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's right there in our hands right now. And uh, I think uh, uh, w working with, um, working with D-Wave, the Leap platform may, has made it so accessible that our teams are doing quantum. That's great. Okay, Jen, uh, do we have some questions from the I think audience? We have, I think we have one. We have got some time for, I think, one question, and I think it's a good one. Um, one of the questions is, are there metrics that can be discussed that illustrate the sp specific commercial use cases in which quantum annealing can, is it advantageous over commercial um, or over classical? And I think, Dustin, I know you have a very specific uh, sort of numbers that you've used before as you think about that, that what metrics you're utilizing. I wanna, I'll hand that to you. Sure. Um, so I can't dive into the specific details of our problem at this time, but in terms of how we've how we've approached this uh, from so our problem, uh, very large scale problem and how we assess that um, we had two needs get insight to the business faster um, and achieve obviously optimal solution. Um, so we what we were what we looked at we benchmarked against a classical method. What have we been doing traditionally? And what we observed there was it was taking, it was almost taking a week in some instances to be able to get that to make the the right decision for the business. So pulling in quantum and benchmarking that we were able to bring that down from hours and in some cases weeks down to minutes and even seconds. So it's really the, uh, what we observe without any statistical variation or difference um, between the optimal solution. So we could achieve the same results in a much quicker, um, yeah, uh, much more efficient amount of time. And that has led us in a lot of ways to be able to simulate outcomes now, do things that we couldn't have achieved in the past. So that's, that's been a, an exciting area we're approaching now. That's great. Sam, I'm going to ask you the same question. What metrics are you using? I know you mentioned um, the BBVA case study, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the tensor networks, there was something about the delta between a tensor network and, and what you saw with D-Wave Hybrid. I don't know if you have other things you want to talk about specifics around metrics. Uh, yeah, first, the metric is always dollars. <laughs> we, we always try to translate. I think um, solving a problem well what the metric will be will vary from problem to problem, but at the end of the day, what's really important is what does it mean in dollars to customer, right? Yeah. Okay, and Kate, thoughts on metrics and the things that you should be thinking about as you help your customers get to business value? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I was trying to think about it, a different way to approach it. Um, one of the things I would love to see from a metrics perspective as we're implementing this uh, project with SCAD is um, I want to see the end customer value. So how is it improving, like, for example, uh, the number of callouts that TSA is having? I want to define really, really 
um, specific end user value um, measures, because I think that is what will help to drive additional adoption um, is if they can see that to the bottom line. So it's not just, you know, the leading indicator, but it's almost like the leading outcome. Yeah, that's great. Uh, well, thank you to our panelists. Um, yeah, thank, thank you all. And Sam and, and, and Dustin, fabulous to have you here. And Alan, I'm gonna hand it back to you to keep going with the rest of the show. Thanks, Jen. Uh, before I move on, let me also thank uh, all the panelists. And I also uh, wanna reinforce a couple of points. Um, Kate's point about, it's, it's all about the, the, the important metrics of the value to the customer. So quantum volume means nothing, which is what you know, the industry may say is an important measure for quantum. No, no, it's all about the value to the customer. I also wanna reinforce a point that Dustin made. Uh, he said, now we can get the same solution faster. Well, there are two things that quantum can do for you. Uh, one of them is actually give you the optimal solution faster than you're currently getting it, significantly faster. The other is you may not be getting the optimal solution. And so in the amount of time allotted, it can get you to a better or to the optimal solution. So it's both about the speed of the computation as well as the quality of the solution. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and move forward. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, D-Wave does have a complete technology and product stack. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit now and uh, start talking about our product set. Uh, our products include the quantum computers, the quantum cloud service, the development tools and professional services. Our current generation annealing quantum computer uh, our Advantage quantum computer is a 5,000 qubit system. That was the first system that got us to the point where we could start tackling real business problems at commercial scale. Um, that is accessible through our Leap quantum cloud service. As I said, designed not just to support research experimentation, but also real business applications in production. In fact, uh, since we've launched it, we've had 99% uptime uh, with real-time access to the quantum computer. Um, we have our complete suite of software development tools for simplifying the development task. And our software development tools are available both within our Leap cloud service. So if you're signed on to Leap, the tools are all there. You can develop your application right there inside Leap or they're open source. You can download them. You can install them on your local system. You can do your development locally and then submit just the application uh, uh, through uh, a leap to the quantum computer. And finally, there's that four phase professional services engagement model, uh, which we call our launch model. I mentioned the leap cloud several times, and um, I cannot under estimate the value of the cloud component of our product set. We decided early on that we wanted to develop our own cloud service. Now, we do work with partners. For example, uh, if you're an AWS Bracket customer, which is the AWS Quantum Cloud Service, you can access our quantum computer through Bracket, uh, but you can't get all of the capabilities in the Leap environment. You can get access to our quantum computer, but through uh, AWS Bracket, you don't get our hybrid solvers. Uh, you don't get uh, you know, our online uh, developer environment. Uh, you don't get our uh, application templates and so on. As I said, we decided early on that it was very important for us to have our own cloud service. First of all, that allows us to always ensure that our customers are getting the best possible experience when leveraging our quantum compute systems and our hybrid solvers. Moreover, there are some serious issues associated with just handing over access to your products to a third party, uh, which is pretty much what everybody else in the quantum industry is doing. Um, they're basically all saying, you know, the way you access us is you go through AWS Bracket or Azure Quantum or Google. But there are some real challenges and issues with that. First of all, you basically get limited access to your customers 
You know very little about their customers. You have very little influence over their journey and ensuring that they have a good experience with your products. You don't get the same insights from them as you would if you had that direct relationship with them. And so you have less of ability and of an ability to leverage the work that they're doing to help you understand how to better your products. And of course, the economics are not as good when you're working through a third party partner versus having your own cloud and infrastructure. So we are strong believers in the importance of our leap quantum cloud service and the value that that brings to us relative to uh, ensuring that our customers always have the best possible experience, always have immediate access to the latest and greatest technology, and that we're able to learn from their use of our systems. And um, in fact, today, uh, we made two announcements of new uh, capabilities that are both enhancing our LEAP cloud service. Uh, the first is that we announced the immediate availability of our third LEAP Advantage system located at the Information Sciences Institute of USC in Marina del Rey, Southern California. So this is the first US-based Advantage quantum computer that's a part of our LEAP cloud service. Uh, this is added to the Advantage system that we already have operational uh, up in Vancouver uh, at our Vancouver headquarters, as well as the Advantage quantum computer that we have operational in Ulish, Germany at the Ulish Supercomputing Center. So there are now three Advantage quantum computers in the Leap Cloud service, one in Canada, one in the US, and one in Europe. Uh, and now for the first time, US-based customers who want to ensure that their applications are running on a US-based quantum computer will have the ability to do that. The second thing we announced is a really important enhancement to one of our hybrid solvers. Uh, at our customer conference last October, we announced a hybrid solver that we called the Constrained Quadratic Model Solver. This is a really important solver in the sense that it opened up our quantum computer to a broad array of important optimization problems. At that time, the constrained quadratic model solver could handle two types of variables. It could handle binary variables where the values would be zero or one, and it could handle discrete variables where the values could be uh, an element from a set, like one of the colors in red, green, blue, or uh, one of the integers between one and 10. Now we are enhancing the constraint quadratic model solver to also so uh, handle continuous variables. Uh, what this means is any real number. So you could have a variable that's, uh, that takes on the value 8.159. This once again opens up an even broader class of applications for the constrained quadratic model solver and some very important applications. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm going to hand it over to Alex Candelo, who is going to give you a demo of the constrained quadratic model solver with continuous variables and talk a little bit about uh, the importance and uh, the types of applications that are enabled by that. So Alex, over to you. Hey, everyone, and thanks, Alan. Hey everyone, so my name is Alex Candelo, and I'm the Director of Algorithms, Performance, and Tools here at D-Wave Systems. And I'm really excited here to show you a demo to give you an idea of how we think about solving problems here at D-Wave, as well as to show off the new capability that Alan just mentioned, which is our support for continuous variables. So I've been at D-Wave now for six years. Uh, I've worked in professional services. I've developed hybrid solvers. I've developed open source tools. And over that time, I've given a number of talks at conferences. And one of the questions that I get fairly frequently is, what sorts of problems aren't good for quantum computing? Um, and up until today, my answer would have been problems with continuous variables. But as of today, we are the first quantum provider to provide problem uh, solver that solves problems with continuous variables. I believe this is the first in the industry and it's been an absolute game changer in terms of our ability to solve practical problems for customers. Okay, so let's jump into the demo. Um, so I wanna start right here on our LEAP dashboard. 
This is what you will see if you were to sign into Leap right now and you had a free account, which you could make right now. You could literally follow everything that I'm gonna be doing live as I do it because everything I'm gonna be doing is available in Leap and in open source. Rather than sort of show you though, unfortunately, all the cool stuff in Leap, I'm gonna jump straight into our set of examples. This set of examples are a set of demonstrations of how we think about solving problems using our quantum computer and our hybrid solvers. Many of these examples are industrially motivated, either built off of a project that uh, we used did with a customer, but some of them are fun. So things like Sudoku as well. So there's a lot of different varieties of problems here. But the whole idea here is that you can very easily jumpstart your application by starting with one of these examples. I'm actually going to hone in on a specific one, which is called 3D bin packing. Now, 3D bin packing is in that category of industrially derived applications. In fact, this demo is an offshoot of work that we did with Johnson & Johnson a few months ago. So this problem is actually derived from a practical application that we worked with a specific customer as part of our launch program. Um, when you sign in, when you open up this example in Leap, you're given a couple options. You can actually go and look at the source code for it, or you can open this up in our online integrated developer environment, which I'm gonna go ahead and do in another tab. But before I jump over to that, uh, that integrated developer environment, I wanna take a moment to talk a little bit about what is 3D bin packing and why might that matter to you all or to some sort of operations research or industrial company. So 3D bin packing is actually an a application that Alan mentioned earlier. The basic idea is this. Let's say I have a set of boxes of different sizes, shapes, weights, characteristics. I want to ship those uh, to somewhere else. And I want to do that as efficiently as possible. Oops, the demo is very eager to start. Um, I want to do that, so I want to pack them into a set of bins, let's say shipping containers, or maybe their delivery trucks, or you know, maybe their uh, shelves at a store. I want to do that as efficiently as possible. So for instance, you can see sort of an image here of like what this problem might look like. Here I have a set of different boxes, all of different sizes, and I want to pack them as efficiently as possible into this space. There's also here a, a, a description of how we think about solving the problem. I'm unfortunately not going to have time to go into re the really cool depths of this, but just to give you a little bit of a taste, um, there's an idea of like why this problem is complicated. The reason it's complicated is that there's actually an infinite number of solutions. These boxes can exist anywhere in 3D space. And not only can those boxes be moved around in 3D space, they can also have you know, many different orientations. They have you know, at least six different orientations. And once you start multiplying all this together, the total solution space for this problem is, is truly enormous. When we think about solving problems here at D-Wave, there's sort of a few concepts that we want to have. The first one is the concept of variables. That actually defines the solution to your problem. And this is where those continuous variables come in. So for instance, in this problem, we have a set of binary variables. Those are the ones that are you know, either yes or no, true or false, zero or one. So for instance, there's a binary variable that says we used a certain bin, that you know, we either used that bin or we didn't. There's also continuous variables in this problem. And in this case, we use those continuous variables for two things. The first thing is to map as a variable that represents the height of the topmost case in the bin. In general, we want to be lowering the cases, have the cases as low as possible so that A, we can make reasonable configurations of cases that map to the real world, uh, and B, so that you know, we can create space that maybe other things could be put on top of them. We also use continuous variables to define the location of the case in the bin. So you know, those exist in 3D space. So I could be uh, 1.5 uh, feet from the wall, I could be pi feet from the wall, I could be 8.7 feet from the wall. You need these continuous values in order to represent those distances. The other two things that we think about here in the context of how we solve problems is we think about having an objective. So in this case, our objective in, uh, put in, in high level terms is to pack things as efficiently as possible. We also have a set of constraints and those constraints have things like the boxes need to be in the bin or the boxes need to not overlap with each other or a box can't be in two places at once. These sorts of these constrained problems are why we use our constrained quadratic model solver. I'll also mention and note that I have not talked about quantum here at all. 
Um, I actually think there maybe was a question earlier about, uh, you know, how do you abstract the quantum away from the user? And, and this is the answer is that we use our hybrid solvers to specify problems in the way that customers want to solve them, which are these sort of easily understood constraints around locations of boxes and, and you know, where they are. And no need to get into the details of quantum unless you want to. Okay, so enough math and enough uh, static images. Let's jump into the fun part. So I'm going to be doing a live demo. And just to give you a sense of like what this looks like, let's start with a simple problem. I'm going to make a couple changes. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fix a random seed so that I'm running the same problems um, just so we can view, do a comparison. I'm also going to run this for about eight seconds because I'm running live. I'm going to start off with just 15 cases of, and these cases are going to be between one and five feet uh, in each dimension. I'm also going to be packing these into a shipping container, which I believe is about 20 feet by eight feet by eight feet. I have constructed a problem. I'm going to be giving our hybrid solver eight seconds. Um, it's going to be putting 15 cases into one bin. Those cases are between one and five feet uh, in dimension, and we're putting them into a shipping container. So let's go ahead and give that a run. Um, and this time, what it's going to do instead is that it will very successfully run on our hybrid solver, which is our solver that combines both quantum and classical resources available in the cloud. What we've seen here is the hybrid solver has, in fact, solved this problem, which is that it's put a set of boxes down onto the floor of our shipping container. OK, so what we also like to do in these sorts of demos is we do like to compare ourselves to what is available in the market right now. Um, and so to that end, I'm going to actually run that exact same problem. Again, we've set the seed um, on a classical solver. This particular classical solver is CoinOr's branch and cut solver. Um, this is an open source uh, solver for this problem class. Um, and you know, it's, it's open source, but it's actually quite popular in the industry. For instance, Google's operation research tools makes use of, of this solver, and, and many, many other packages make use of it. And so, like before, um, under the same conditions, this solver was also able to, to solve this problem. Um, but actually, oh yeah, you can even see it here. Um, we already see we have a little bit of a problem, which is that one of our boxes is not perfectly on the ground. So this solver, in the same amount of time, wasn't able to find quite as good a solution as, as we were. So far, also, this problem isn't all that uh, difficult. You can sort of see that I could pretty much just put everything straight onto the ground here. This isn't a very constrained problem. It's not a very difficult problem. So let's actually just make it just a little bit harder. And instead of solving 15 cases, I want to solve 17. So just a few more cases into the mix, which hopefully now starts to make this where we genuinely have to start stacking them on top of each other. And when we do this, again, solving on our classical solver, we see that sort of same pattern. It is, in fact, able to find a solution, but this solution isn't really what we want. These boxes are hanging in the air. Um, you know, they're not really optimally placed. It was just able to put them into the case in that amount of time. So of course, by the way that I've constructed this demo, you can imagine what comes next, which is that I'm now going to run this on our hybrid solver. And so in this time, rather than running it on the classical one uh, that we pulled from open source, we're going to be making use of the hybrid solver in Leap for that same amount of eight seconds. And as we can see, it does a much, much better job with that problem in the same amount of time. So we're really starting to see some of that, that power. And, and this is a theme with D-Wave and we've seen with our customers over and over again, which is that customers often have a very short amount of time that they want to solve their problem in, and they want the best solution they can possibly get in that time. So here in this eight second time window, we were able to go from, uh, you know, we were able to get much further into our solving than, than the alternative. So I want to do one last uh, demo here, which is rather than just trying to pack one bin, um, which I think you know anyone who's packed a vehicle, you know probably you're thinking maybe I could have done this. Um, let's go ahead into two, and we're going to pack those as optimally as possible. And this time we're going to use 35 boxes instead, um, and we're going to run that get one last time on our hybrid solver. So when we do this, this has actually made the problem a lot more complicated. And specifically, it's added something called interactions between variables. This is a technical term, but the basic idea is that there are some of the binary variables that encode whether a bin is used, and the binary variables that encode which box is in which bin have to have this second order interaction. Um, and you can see that here in the sort of quadratic terms, that means interactions. 
So you can see now that it's done a pretty good job. It's put all the boxes, most of the boxes rather, into one of the two bins. And there's just a couple left over that didn't fit, which it then put into the second bin. I'll just end this demo by uh, seeing one more error message, which is that I'm going to attempt to run this now on the classical solver. But when I do that, it's actually going to tell me uh, that it doesn't support quadratic interactions, those, those second order interactions that I was describing before. And so not only can we solve the problem relative to this particular solver better, we also can solve problems that, that it can't. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, th that was a great demo. And uh, I do want to reiterate something that Alex said, which is that uh, this is now just in our Leap Quantum Cloud service, and anybody can sign up for free time on Leap. If you go to uh, our website, you can get through to Leap. It takes about 30 uh, seconds to sign up. You get a minute of free time. Uh, if you're willing to open source the work that you're doing, you can renew that minute every month. And so you could go to Leap, and you could actually run this demo for yourself and see exactly how this works. Okay, so. Uh, one of the things that Alex did show you was the Leap dashboard. So I've talked a lot about our Leap Quantum Cloud service, and this demo was done inside our Leap Cloud service. That's the production Quantum Cloud service. This production cloud service consists of um, software that we developed running on AWS servers. Um, there are two access points uh, within AWS for accessing Leap, you can either come in through the uh, AWS uh, US West in Oregon access point, or you can come in through the uh, AWS EU Central in Germany access point. Um, so we have some redundancy in the system uh, to ensure high availability. And then we've got direct connections from AWS in the US to our quantum computers in Marina del Rey, California and Burnaby, Canada, and direct connect from AWS in Europe to our quantum computer at Ulysses, Germany. And then all of our Leap software, including the front end, uh, the integrated developer environment that uh, uh, Alex started to show you, and all the hybrid solvers, the constrained quadratic model solver, CQM, as well as our other solvers, they all run on AWS servers, both CPUs and GPUs, and we spin them up and down as we need them. I also want to point out that the three pictures you see here are actual photos of the three systems at their locations in Marina del Rey, uh, Burnaby, uh, and at ULIC. So this system is uh, you know, a, a commercial grade system, uh, fully up and running. This is what we use when we're working with our customers and what our customers use when they access Leap. Okay, I talked a bit about the annealing uh, quantum computers uh, and in particular the Advantage system, but I wanna spend just a minute talking a bit more about, uh, about our annealing quantum computers. So yeah, as I've already said, our current generation system, which we launched about a year ago, and then we launched a performance update to that about six months ago, it's the 5,000 qubit quantum computer where each qubit is connected to 15 others. When combined with our hybrid solvers, it's able to support problems with up to one million variables. And this is what's allowed us to get to the point where we can solve uh, real commercial problems at production scale today. Um, the big circle on the right is what an advantage quantum computer looks like. The small circle at the bottom, uh, that's a look inside the refrigerator at the IO wiring from um, room temperature down to the chip that runs at uh, superconducting uh, temperatures. Then the picture above that is our superconducting circuit card that the chip mounts into. And the, picture, the small picture at the top is our superconducting quantum CPU, the, or you know, as we affectionately call the quantum processing unit or the QPU. And as you can see, this is all commercial grade technology. You're not looking at you know, a bunch of wires wrapped around a room in some you know, crazy fashion. This is all commercial grade technology. Uh, about six months ago, we also announced the roadmap for our next 
generation advantage system, advantage two. Uh, we said it will have over 7,000 qubits. Each qubit will be connected to 20 others. Uh, and we will continue down our path of uh, uh, reducing noise and increasing coherence time, allowing us to solve larger and more complex problems faster. And that's our model. Now, every couple of years, uh, increase the performance of the system to be able to solve larger and more complex problems faster. With respect to gate model systems, uh, I mentioned that we are uh, now also developing a gate model system. And we are going to be using superconducting technology for our gate model system as well. And I wanted to take a minute to talk about why. Um, you know, the obvious reason that you might think of is that, well, our annealing quantum computers are built on superconducting technology. We know and understand it. In fact, we're world leaders with superconducting technology. Uh, arguably, our advantage processor chip is one of the largest superconducting chips in the world. Um, so yeah, it's natural for us to do superconducting, but there's another reason, uh, a more important reason. We are strong believers that superconducting is the best approach to a scaled error corrected gate model quantum computer, better than ion trap systems and better than photonic systems, which are the two other primary approaches that are being explored today. And I wanted to talk about why we are strong believers in superconducting. And I want to do it uh, by talking about a specific application. The application that I want to talk about is Shor's algorithm for factoring large semi prime numbers. These are numbers that are a product of two primes. And the reason why factoring large semi-primes is so important is that that's what RSA cryptography is based on. If you could factor large semi-primes quickly, you would break RSA and basically break what you know, um, most uh, uh, industry runs on with respect to uh, crypto and security. So a lot of work has been done to try to understand what it would take to run Shor's algorithm on various quantum computers. And there's a body of academic uh, research and work and papers that have been written on this. What we now know is that if you want to run Shor's algorithm on a superconducting quantum computer, it will require about eight hours to factor, uh, let's, let's assume you want to do this with a 2000 bit number, because that's state of the art for RSA today. So you want to factor a 2000 bit number. Running Shor's algorithm on a superconducting quantum computer will take about eight hours and it will require about 20 million qubits. So you can see that at 50 qubits on a gate model system, we're a ways off from that. Again, the reason why I say we're seven plus years away from commercial gate model systems. However, if you want to factor that same 2000 bit number on an ion trap system, it's not going to take eight hours. It's going to take 100 days. It will take almost a third of a year and it will require a billion qubits. If you wanted to factor it on a photonic system, it would take a full year and also a billion qubits. So why is this? Why is it that superconducting is so much faster and requires fewer qubits. It has to do with the gate speeds. The gates are you know, basically those instructions in the algorithm when you're programming a gate model quantum computer. And if we just look at superconducting versus ion trap for a minute, superconducting gates run at about 20 nanoseconds. Ion trap gates run at about 500 microseconds. This means ion trap gates are 1,000 to 10,000 times slower than superconducting gates. That's why problems will run so much faster on a superconducting quantum computer. Moreover, you don't need coherence times that are as long on a superconducting quantum computer because the computations are so much faster. So when you talk to an ion trap person, they may say to you, well, ions are perfect qubits. They have, they're much higher quality. They have much longer coherence times than superconducting qubits. This is true, but they're not a thousand to 10,000 times better. And in fact, when you wrap together the qubits with the gates, it turns out that superconducting 
is far more efficient. It requires fewer qubits and allows you to perform computations much faster. And that's why we are strong believers that superconducting is the right approach to gate model quantum computing. Okay, so what about the D-Wave approach to building uh, a gate model system? First of all, I mentioned noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. We're not interest in, in, interested in NISC systems. NISC systems are basically fabricate some qubits, attach some IO lines and try to wiggle the qubits to get them to do something. There's no evidence that a NISC system can deliver any application value. It just hasn't been demonstrated yet. There are toy problems, but no evidence that you can do this at commercial scale. Um, so for us, it's all about getting to a scaled error corrected gate model system, because we're all about commercial and everything we do is focused on trying to get to commercial as quickly as possible. So our roadmap for a scaled error corrected gate model system has multiple phases over a number of years. The first phase is just fabrication of the qubits and demonstration of the coherence times required. And the reason why I say this is because we're using very different qubits from what everybody else is using, even different from what the other superconducting vendors are using. So fabricate the qubits and demonstrate the coherence time. The next thing we need to do is put control on the same chip as the qubits. We have that today on our annealing systems. I'll talk about in a minute why that's so important. Nobody else is able to do that today. We do it on our annealing systems. We're gonna do it on our gate model systems. So we need to put control in the same chip and demonstrate that we can maintain the same coherence times with control. That will then allow us to build our first prototype error corrected logical qubits. Small scale to start with, but built in a module that is itself scalable onto the final phase where we build that scaled error corrected uh, gate model quantum computer. Now, there are a number of important technologies that we had to develop for our annealing quantum computer that are directly applicable to building this scaled error corrected gate model system. First is the type of qubit. Everybody else in the superconducting space uses what's called transmod qubits. These are controlled by voltage. We use flux qubits. They're controlled by magnetic flux and current. There's an important reason why we use flux qubits. We use them in our annealing systems and we will be using them in our gate model systems. First of all, um, voltage controlled qubits require microwave lines, gigahertz, uh, speed or greater lines. And that's very costly and very complicated. With uh, flux-based qubits, we do not require microwave lines. We can run at a couple of hundred megahertz, which is much less costly and much easier to build and manage. Also, flux-based qubits have much higher inductance than the transmon qubits. And what this means is that when you're trying to connect qubits on different chips, if you want to scale out horizontally and have different chips with qubits on them and connect between those chips, what you need in order to, pres to preserve entanglement between those chips is high inductance. And flux-based qubits have much higher inductance than transmon voltage-controlled qubits. So we will be using flux-based qubits. Secondly, we fabricate our qubits in a multi-layer stack. Everybody else fabricates qubits in a single layer on the wafer. We use a multi-layer stack. This is what allows us to get the density that we have today. And that's why we have 5,000 qubits on a single chip. However, when you have that kind of density, you're very sensitive to small differences in the fabrication process across the chip. And so your qubits need to be tunable so that you can homogenize their operation. This means you need to design and build qubits where you can read parameters from those qubits and adjust those parameters to homogenize the operation of the qubits. We've got a, a lot of IP built around, uh, uh, created around building tunable qubits and how to tune those qubits. And then finally, that on-chip control. 
on uh, controlling the same chip as the qubits. It's what, it's what really allows us to do the tuning of the qubits. It also gives us addressing and pipelining. So for example, we're able to control 5,000 qubits with 200 IO lines, whereas everybody else uses one IO line per qubit. The point is these are very important technologies, hard to develop, that we've developed and proven out through our annealing program that are directly applicable to our gate model system. And we believe it'll allow us to move more rapidly toward a scaled error corrected gate model system than others. Um, and then finally, uh, we have a complete management team. Um, that's everything from go to market to R&D uh, through to GNA. From a go to market perspective, uh, you've already met Jen Houston. Uh, she's our host and moderator today. Jen is our chief marketing officer with over 20 years of experience in commercial marketing. Uh, and then our sales and professional services organization is run by Mark Snedeker. Mark joined us about a year ago. He came to us from Accenture where he ran their federal business. As I said, we have a, a complete R&D organization. Uh, the software and cloud services are led by Michelle McCready and the systems by Mark Johnson. Uh, we have uh, you know, you know, roughly 40 PhDs in the company and we have a complete GNA organization, uh, including John uh, Markovich, who is our CFO, who you met earlier and we'll be taking you through the numbers in just a minute. Um, I just wanted to conclude this section by reiterating the fact that D-Wave is the first and only commercial quantum computing company. We got here by taking a very different path to quantum from everybody else. We decided to start with annealing, which is what has allowed us to get here. And we now know that annealing is and always will be an important part of the computing landscape because there's classes of problems that require annealing in order to be able to get a speed up. But we are going to be focused not just on annealing, but annealing and gate. Currently, we're working with our customers on what I'll call evolutionary problems. These are problems that they need to solve today. They are solving today, but they're hard problems. They're using heuristics to get good enough solutions. But with quantum computing, we can give them better solutions or faster solutions, giving them business benefit on our path to those revolutionary applications that really open up the market for quantum. And hand it over to John to take you through the financial. So in preparation for our DSPAC transaction, we developed a very comprehensive bottoms up five-year financial plan. And we are projecting a revenue CAGR of approximately 160% over the next five years, commencing with a targeted $11 million in revenue for this year, that represents approximately uh, 75. Sorry, John. Sorry, John. Alex, could you please go on mute again? Thank you. <clears throat> sorry, John. Okay, so uh, we're targeting $11 million in uh, revenue for this year that represents a little over a 75% increase over our revenue in uh, 2021. In 2021, uh, as Alan highlighted earlier, we had 55, uh, over 55 commercial customers that represents an increase of approximately 28% uh, in the number of commercial customers over the prior year. And uh, we also had over two dozen uh, Global 2000 customers last year. That represents about a 60% increase over the number of Global uh, 2000 customers that we had in 2020. As we entered 2022, over 40% of our targeted $11 million in revenue was supported by uh, 2021 year-end uh, firm backlog and contracts that we entered into in prior periods that renew throughout uh, 2022. Going forward, the growth in our revenue will be driven by the broadening of our customer base through a significant expansion of our direct sales organization, as well as our network of channel partners with approximately 25% of the use of proceeds from this transaction to be applied towards our various go-to-market initiatives. In addition, uh, a continued expansion in the number of applications that we are addressing with our customers, as well as an expansion in the number of applications used per customer 
as we solve increasingly larger and more complex problems, as well as an increase in the average transaction size or revenue per customer over the forecast period. So underpinning our internal growth uh, initiatives is the projected growth of the optimization portion of the TAM that we highlighted earlier. Although we believe that we have virtually no competition in the optimization sector of the TAM, our financial projections assume that we only capture 15 to 30% of the TAM depending upon the year. And our pro projections do not include any revenue contribution from the linear algebra and factorization portions of the TAM that our annealing technology can address, nor does the revenue projections include any contribution from our gate model program. The 57 to 84% increase in our gross margins is principally driven by the gradual shift in our revenue mix towards the higher margin cloud-based quantum computing as a service recurring revenue that increases uh, from about 50% of total revenue this year to in excess of 90% of the total revenue in 2026. The expansion in our EBITDA margins closely correlates with the expansion in the gross margins that reflects the high degree of operating leverage that is inherent in our business model, with EBITDA projected to turn positive in the second quarter of 2025. Next slide, Ellen. So with respect to the cash dynamics of the business, the targeted net proceeds from this transaction provides us with a fully funded business plan. Over the next several years, we plan to invest aggressively in software and systems development <clears throat> with approximately 30% of the use of proceeds from this transaction to be applied to our investments in internally developed software and approximately 40% of the use of proceeds to be applied towards our annealing and gate model systems development with a significant portion of our systems development spend applicable to both platforms. We are projecting that the business turns cash flow positive on a sustained basis in the first quarter of 2025. We have a very capital efficient business model due to the relatively low cost of building our annealing systems that cost less than $2 million to build and calibrate. Uh, as Alan mentioned earlier, uh, we also have very substantial uh, annealing production capacity already in place with each of our uh, annealing quantum computing systems uh, capable of supporting between 25 and $30 million of annual revenue. With that, I'll hand it over to uh, Emil to talk about the transaction. Uh, yes, if someone could start my video there, that would be great. Okay. Uh, good to see everybody. Um, uh, this is a very typical uh, DSPAC uh, transaction, as you can see. Uh, we have $300 million in trust. We have commitments to uh, for $40 million in the pipe. Um, at essentially a pre-money value of 1.2 billion. Um, you can see the sources and uses or the uses of the cash there. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over uh, unless there's anything uh, uh, for questions here to John to talk about a unique structure we put in place um, to the benefit of, uh, of future shareholders in the SPAC. When we announced the transaction in early February, we uh, announced a 5 million share bonus structure uh, this, that this chart outlines. And this is designed to lower the cost basis for the public SPAC shareholders who do not redeem their shares. This 5 million uh, share bonus structure will be allocated to the non-redeeming SPAC shareholders on a pro rata basis upon the closing of the transaction. The structure is designed to incentivize the public SPAC investors to retain and not redeem their shares in the DPCM capital uh, SPAC. So I'll, I'll provide a couple of examples. So under the first column, under a scenario of no redemptions, 
the actual cost basis afforded to the public SPAC shareholders is $8.57 or a 14% discount to the uh, $10. Under a 30% uh, redemption scenario, again, that 5 million shares uh, gets uh, allocated per rata to the non-redeeming shareholders. That results in a cost basis per share of a little over $8 uh, or $8.08 and, and, uh, and so on and so forth with respect to higher rates uh, of redemptions. We have also developed a separate bonus pool for our pipe investors, such that the cost basis for both the public SPAC shareholders and the pipe investors will mirror one another. Okay, thanks, John, and uh, thanks, Emil. Um, just to close out before we hand it back to Jen to moderate the Q&A, um, you know, as I pointed out, we are quite unique in the quantum industry. Uh, we decided to start with annealing, now building annealing and gate systems, but starting with annealing has given us a first mover advantage when it comes to commercial. We're out there today uh, building the business with customers and applications that benefit their business operations, and we have a complete suite of products to be able to support that. Uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Jen to moderate the Q&A. Great. Thank you all. Great. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Emil. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Alex. It was a great, uh, great presentation today. We have a lot of really fabulous questions, so I'm just going to jump in. Uh, I'm just a really great questions. Thanks to everyone who's added them. Reminder, if you do want to ask a question, put it into the Q&A, and I will see it. No one else will. It's anonymous, and I'm not going to name who said these things. I'm just going to ask the question. So the first question is, um, as sort of a statement, you are the only company that, that does annealing-based systems. Is there anyone else that is close, and how long of a lead do you have? Alan, I'm going to ask that to you. Yeah, so the answer to that question is there's nobody else that's close. There are a, a couple of companies we've heard of that have said that they are interested in getting started in the annealing space, but they're like where we were 10 years ago. Um, so we, we actually have a huge lead in this space. As I said, it's taken us 10 years to get to this point and we're not standing still. We're continuing to enhance our systems. Moreover, we have that huge 200 US granted patent moat that we've built uh, around our technology that frankly would make it very difficult for anybody to come into this space, even if we were to stumble and uh, you know, have a hard time um, continuing to enhance our products. But we don't believe that to be the case. We've got a stellar track record of product delivery and we expect that to continue. That's great. Thanks, Alan. I have a sort of a follow up to that. And I think you hit on a couple of points, but I want to just make make sure we get it. Um, do you expect your current IP will protect this segment of the market? And what's your best guess as to why no one else has been working on annealing? Yeah. So um, first of all, our current IP is, um, is quite extensive. Uh, around this segment, but it's actually even a bit broader into the gate model space. We've, you know, as we've worked through uh, our IP strategy and, um, you know, driven the patent activity within the company, we've tried to be as broad as possible with uh, the, the patenting of our technology to, uh, first of all, protect the uh, annealing space, but also to have some IP in the gate model space as well. And that'll now start growing as we're developing a gate model system. With respect to why nobody else uh, decided to go into the annealing space, uh, this has to do with history. Um, you know, as, as I said, we got started in this space over 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, uh, it was actually not even believed that you would be able to build a gate model system. There was some you know, early research going on, but nobody really had line of sight to how to build a gate model system. But it was believed that you could build an annealing system. And so since we got started at that point in time, we said, well, let's go build an annealing quantum computer. We knew that there were some advantages. We knew that it would re be really good at solving this important optimization class of problems. We knew it could not solve all quantum problems, but we nonetheless thought that that was the right starting point. Five years ago, when pretty much everybody else decided to jump into the quantum space, at that point in time, the science and the engineering had advanced to the point where it was believed that you probably could build a gate model system. And at that point in time, it was also thought 
that a gate model quantum computer could solve any quantum problem. So if you're going to get started then, if you, if you think you can build a gate model system and you think it's going to be able to do anything, you might as well build that because while annealing may be easier to build, we know that there are some things it does well and some things it can't do. So that's why everybody else jumped on the gate model. But what happened was last year, new science, right? I mean, you know, the research in, in this area just is amazing and continues. And, and last year, what we learned is that there is this application bifurcation that while annealing is really good at optimization, gate model systems are not good at optimization and likely will never be able to deliver a speed up in that area. So the assumption five years ago that the gate model system could do anything was just an incorrect assumption. And that's why we ended up in the situation where we're the only ones doing annealing and that's created a huge market opportunity for us. Thanks, Alan. I'm going to actually put put a little bit of point on the uh, the optimization question. We did get asked, can you explain in greater detail on why only annealing can do optimization problems? Maybe talk yeah. a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, uh, so as I mentioned early on, um, annealing quantum computers do only one thing. They find the low point in a multidimensional landscape, and any optimization problem can be mapped into that. So that's why annealing quantum computers are so good at solving optimization problems. So what's the problem with gate model systems? Well, the problem with gate model systems is that they're not native optimization engines. And in order to get them to solve an optimization problem, you need to wrap classical compute around them. It needs to be hybrid, right? Part classical, part quantum. Well, the research results that came out middle of last year pointed out that the cost of that classical compute required to get a gate model system to solve an optimization problem is so high that it outweighs all of the benefits that the underlying quantum computer can provide. So in fact, not only can you not get a speed up, typically if you try to use the gate model system to solve an optimization problem, it'll run worse than if you just tried to solve it classically. Great. Thank you. So um, I have a couple more technical questions about annealing and then a couple of gate questions because you can imagine the, the group has some questions about that. So one question was, um, how is an annealing qubit produced? We hear about freezing temperatures and fragile systems that the gate needs. Uh, just curious about how D-Wave produces its qubits and if it's any easier. Uh, so uh, annealing qubits are created uh, through superconducting uh, wires, loops. Um, and so, you know, the point of superconducting is that when you inject current into a wire at, uh, that's superconducting, uh, it flows uninhibited, no friction. And so what we do is we create loops on our chips uh, out of superconducting material. We run them at superconducting temperatures, and then we inject current flowing in both directions, clockwise and counterclockwise clockwise in the loop. And that's the superposition, okay? And then we put various um, biases or forces on the current in that loop in order to bias it to the solution of the problem. And I think the follow-up to that, Alan, was, is it any easier to produce a superconducting qubit for gate versus annealing? Um, so creating the qubit is no harder uh, if you're creating a superconducting gate model qubit than if you're creating a superconducting annealing qubit. However, gate model qubits need longer coherence times than annealing qubits. Because, because the annealing computer runs just that one algorithm, the annealing algorithm, the low point in a multidimensional landscape, um, and that runs in a relatively short period of time, the coherence times for annealing don't need to be that long, right? So you can get really good results with 10 or 20 nanosecond coherence times, amazing results with 100 nanosecond coherence time. A microsecond coherence time on an annealing system is just like nirvana, right? For gate model systems, you really need to be at between 10 and 100 microseconds, right? So you know, 10 to 100 times longer coherence times. That's the challenge around building the gate model qubits. Great. Let's talk a bit about gate model since we ended there. Um, sort of a two questions. What's the timeline for D-Wave's gate model quantum computer? And are you starting with error correction at launch or will error correction come later? Yeah. So um, it is a multi-year program. Um, 
We have not announced the time to get to a fully scaled error corrected system, but you've heard me say that I think for everybody, it's seven plus years to get to the point where you have that fully scaled error corrected system. I mean, think about Shor's algorithm, 20 million qubits on a superconducting system. Even if we started with 50 qubits, which is where gate is today, and doubled every two years, it would take 20 to 25 years to get there. So, you know, even at seven years, you know, some might argue that's being a bit optimistic, but, but that's kind of what we think it's going to take the industry to get to that scaled error corrected system that can solve commercial problems. Um, so it's going to take time to get there. Um, however, we are doing it in steps. And yes, um, every step along the way will include error correction, except the first two steps. The first two steps are basic technology. Build the qubit with the right coherence time, add control to the chip so that we can build out the rest of the modules. And then our first system will be a small scale, uh, partially error corrected system. Uh, it will uh, basically be a small surface code 17 physical qubits per logical qubit with a relatively large number of logical qubits on the chip, just demonstrating a partially error corrected system, but done in a module that we can then scale out both in terms of size of the surface code for better error correction, as well as number of uh, logical qubits. That's great. Um, we had a quick question, who makes your chips? So all of the IP for the fabrication of those chips is D-Wave IP. Uh, we design the process for fabrication. We design the materials for fabrication. However, those processes can be run on standard CMOS tools. And as a result, we do not have our own clean room. We partner with Skywater in Minnesota. Uh, that became public when Skywater went public and had to talk about some of their large customers. So Skywater fabricates our chips, but they fabricate them uh, using our process and materials to our specs. And they, they, they're able to use those processes for us only. Thanks. Um, okay, what learnings from superconducting technology can we leverage from our annealing systems to help develop the gate model systems? I know you touched on that, but at a high level. Yeah, it, it really is, uh, from a system perspective, it really is those key core technologies around flux-based qubits, uh, tunable qubits, um, on-chip control, on-chip addressing and pipelining. Those are really the things that uh, we, we uh, realized were required for a commercial system and that we had to design and develop and, and frankly commercialize that we now believe we can apply to a gate model system. However, um, we've also uh, learned a lot about hybrid algorithms. Uh, you know, as we now have multiple hybrid algorithms that are a part of our system, um, our LEAP uh, quantum cloud service. And so we will bring that to the gate model space as well. So it's both um, systems and software. And of course, once our gate model systems are available, they will be available in LEAP alongside the annealing systems. And we will have integrated tools for the use of those quantum computers. Great. Question on a strategy behind systems deployments. How many systems will you need to deploy in order to meet the financial metrics that you set out today? Yeah, so John, John touched on this. Um, uh, first of all, over the five year uh, um, projection period, um, we are um, assuming only optimization and as a result, only annealing. So there's no gate model in those projections. Given that, um, an annealing quantum computer can uh, support between $25 million and $30 million worth of revenue per year. So what this means is that you know, you know, three years from now, we actually need only three annealing quantum computers to support you know, on the order of $75 million of revenue. If we go out five years with 550 million of revenue, okay, at that point, we're talking about 20 to 25 systems. So as John said, this is not a capital intensive business. Great. So I'm gonna to move to software because there's a great question here about software. Um, it seems like quantum computing is as much about software as the hardware. 
this person was listening deeply because that's a true statement. You talked about various generations of the hardware. Where are you on the hybrid solver and what is the cadence with which you iterate on that solver? Yeah, so uh, we actually have three hybrid solvers. Um, our very first hybrid solver uh, was launched Oh, wow. well over a year ago. Yeah, February 2019, actually. February 2019. That was our binary quadratic model solver. Um, and that solver could support only binary variables. We then uh, launched, I don't know, six months, a year after that, our discrete quadratic model solver. That solver could support binary variables as well as discrete variables, um, whereas dis discrete variables are, you know, uh, an element from a set, right? Not just zero or one, but maybe one of the integers between one and 10. Then uh, about six months ago at our customer conference last October, we announced our constrained quadratic model solver. This is a solver that actually allows us to incorporate constraints into the problems that are solved in a native fashion. Uh, and that really, uh, made it much simpler to build applications on our system. And the applications could be much more compact, meaning we could solve much larger problems. Uh, the other thing that was really important about the constrained quadratic model solver was that it, for the first time, raised the level of abstraction for building the system. Now, if you were a data scientist or a data analyst who uh, was used to linear programming or mixed integer programming or quadratic programming, you did not have to reformulate your problem for the quantum computer. You could simply specify in a symbolic language the objective function and the constraints to our system, to the constraint quadratic model solver, and it would go ahead and solve the problem mapping to the quantum computer as needed. And then today, we announced the incorporation of continuous variables into the constraint quadratic model solver. So, you know, we have a history of roughly, you know, every six to eight months delivering updates to the hybrid solvers. That's a really important component uh, of our product set. And, and we do enhancements to all our software. In fact, our Leap Quantum Cloud service, uh, we, we update the software every two weeks. Every Wednesday, uh, we do a push of uh, functionality and we're constantly enhancing uh, the system. Uh, sometimes it's adding administrative functionality to make it easier for uh, our customers or our partners to administer the system. Uh, sometimes it's improving functionality that's there like uh, our integrated developer environment. We just made available version two of our integrated developer environment, which provides some enhanced capabilities or the constrained quadratic model solver. So we're constantly enhancing our software. That's great. And I made a mistake. It's 2020 that the first solver came out, February 2020. Um, so just, def and I think, Alan, you said, yeah, we're, we're on two week sprints. So every other Wednesday, we, uh, yep. we put those out there. Okay. So here's another question, um, which I thought, and I think you began to touch on, but just to dive in a little bit more, and we probably have time for about this question and maybe one other one. Um, the front ends app, you had mentioned that the front ends and apps hide the complexity of the quantum process behind from, from end users. Can you give some examples of how D-Wave hides that complexity and makes it easier for people to get started in quantum? Well, you, you know, honestly, the best example is the one I just gave you on the constrained quadratic model solver, right? Now, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a quadratic program, you've got an objective function, you've got a set of constraints that that define your problem. And, and this is the language of data scientists and data analysts. They use these problems all the time. You can just take that specification and feed it into our constrained quadratic model solver and we'll handle the mapping to the quantum computer. So, um, so, so that really is raising the level of abstraction. And we're gonna start doing that in other uh, application domains as well. Uh, linear programming was the first domain. We're gonna start doing that in other domains. Okay. And then we also got a question about sort of how does that onboarding work of bringing on the, the four-phase model? Um, and specifically, can you use as an example, like how do you how do you help get customers there quickly? Yeah, so, uh, so first of all, uh, one of the things that I did not mention was those first two phases where uh, we do the application evaluation and uh, we build out the proof of concept with our customer. They bundle together everything that's needed for those projects. So that includes the professional services time, that includes the LEAP uh, quantum and hybrid solver access time that's required, uh, and that includes training. 
Uh, we have, as you know, Jen, uh, a training program because you run training for us, um, uh, which is a very comprehensive training program that uh, customers can, uh, they either uh, get integrated as a part of the first two phases of the launch program, or you can buy separately, or if you have additional training uh, needs, uh, you know, you can purchase a seat for uh, one of your uh, developers, or uh, you can purchase a whole session for 20 or 30 uh, of your developers. So uh, the first two phases bundle everything you need to get started, including training. Um, but you can also uh, operate outside of the launch program if you wanted to. You could buy training to get started and then buy some leap time separately. We call that do it yourself. Uh, we don't encourage that because what we find is that um, it's easy to get started and get something up and running on the quantum computer. But when you want to scale that and get the best possible performance, uh, it's better if we help you do that, at least through the first application. Then once you've worked with us through that first application, uh, you know, it's much easier for you to do it a second or third time. In fact, uh, you know, Dustin from Save On Foods fell into that category. We did a first application with them. And then when they moved on to their second application, they just bought some advisory services for us, but they did from us, but they did the bulk of the heavy lifting themselves. Okay, I got one more. I know we're at time, but this is a great question. What are your thoughts on the current benchmarking schemes and how should investors compare performance characteristics among the various competitors? Uh, it's that's such a sad story. Um, <laughs> the, re, no, the, the, the problem is really at the end of the day, all you care about is application benchmarking. That's really all that matters. But the problem is, except for the D-Wave annealing system, there is no quantum computer out there that can actually run applications. So you're getting all these esoteric benchmarks or approaches to benchmarking that really are not helpful in understanding when and where you can use a particular quantum computer. So I, I just think we're in a world of hurt when it comes to benchmarking, but it's kind of obvious why the systems other than the D-Wave annealing system just aren't capable of solving real problems. And as a result, they're not capable of running the benchmark that customers really care about, but you can benchmark on our annealing systems with real applications. Great. Well, we're out of time. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I know that there were questions we didn't get answered. So happy to follow up if there are questions that you'd like to have specifically have a conversation with us about. I know Alan and John in particular are looking forward to spending some time with you all. So let's do some follow up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emil and, and John and Alan and Alex and the whole team for joining us today. Have a wonderful afternoon. And thank you, Jen, for putting this all together. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs>